I love Robert Sergel's work. I like this really high contrast, black and white, his clean lines. What happens in this story is he sort of tells his story with shapes and objects. Um, this guy is down in the basement doing his laundry and he notices this Nintendo controller and a whole box of junk. And it becomes this kind of Christian memory prompt as he sees the button on the Nintendo thing reminds him of another button on his door button. And it takes you back into this flashback. So that was a kind of cool technique. Here's another really interesting panel situation. This is one page of a six-page story called Anatomy of Prattfall. And it's by a brother and sister team, um, Peter and Maria Hoey. And each of the six pages depicts a continuous scene and a single moment in time. So it could possibly be drawn as one panel, but they choose to break it down into 12 panels. So it's, you can sort of tell from this first page that something really bad is going to happen with that piano and that big window. Um, but how exactly that comes to pass is through all these intricate, this sort of this narrative diagram. Um, and the panel breaks here. They're not indicating a break in time or space, but they are making you focus your attention on all these different elements of the story that are happening simultaneously, and then they're going to end up converging. Like in the first panel, there's a B. In the eighth panel and the tenth panel, this, these two people are arranging a tryst. Um, in the seventh panel, there's a pile of leaves and a lit cigarette. This is another amazing piece in the book. Um, you know, I just want to say, I, this, the piece by the poet is a collaboration. I, I sort of have a personal bias against collaborative comics. Um, I don't know. It, I, I've, among the many submissions for Best American Comics were a lot of more mainstream type stuff, like DC's Vertigo imprint, and some really really nice books with their team pieces, like there's an illustrator and there's a writer. And um, even though some of that stuff was really good and I felt like I should include it, I ended up not including it because, I don't know, I just, I just feel like collaboration is cheating somehow. <laughs> but this piece I like, and this piece actually is also a collaboration between a writer and an artist. But they didn't exactly collaborate, like the writer wrote it and the artist drew it kind of separately. Actually, I don't quite understand how they did it, but it was a, it's a little square pamphlet comic that was created to go with a, a record album, a reissue of a recording by this, this guy, Serge Gainsbourg, uh, and, and Jane Birkin, which hit number 69 in the pop charts. So it's this little square comic book about the size of a 45 record, but it was meant to go with a little record. Um, and it's, it's, the story is about the collaboration and the romantic relationship between Gaines Ward and Jane Bergen and how they met on a movie set in the 60s. So it starts on one end with Serge's story, talking about his career a little bit and how he ended up working with Jane. And then you flip the whole thing over, it's a foot book. And on the other end, Jane's story begins. And in the narrative of the book, the two characters are traveling toward one another in time and space until they literally collide at the center of the spread in the 69 position, which is just <laughs> really, really a virtuosic manipulation of time and space in this literal way. Plus, I like this piece because it makes you have to turn the physical book upside down. You have to turn the whole Best American Comics upside down in order to read it. This is a panel from Joe Sacco's work. Um, he has a long piece in the book. It's, it's very hard to talk about his stuff because so much of what Sacco does is to represent unspeakable, unrepresentable things. And in this panel, he's uh, illustrating an eyewitness's memory of a massacre by Israeli soldiers in a Palestinian refugee camp in 1956. His whole graphic novel is a, a painstaking recreation of this event through many interviews with eyewitnesses. Uh, so 
this guy here is describing to Josako. Um, in the present moment, how people were lined up and shot at this place 50 years ago. This place where right now, there's a line of people for the ATM. Um, and a little further on, you can piece, uh, we're hearing another eyewitness history. And now we're in the past. Now it's 50 years ago when this narrator, when a guy telling the story as a young boy, and he turns the corner and sees this massacre that just happened. And the next panel is back into the present where this man is now, you know, 60 years old, taking us, taking Joe Sacco and along with Joe, us back to this place where this happened. And it's just really staggering to me. It runs as a spread of like two opposite panels. I can't, I can't think of any other art form that can quite capture this temporal and spatial and, and emotional collision. Uh, you know, where did this event go? Where is it going on? I won't say anything more about this because just, you know, you, you can't really speak about it. So let's go on. All right. This is a piece by a young cartoonist I had never heard of, John Pham. It's a memoir about his middle school. He has these really beautiful unusual page layouts. I like this panel because he he locates us immediately in space with a map. Here's his studio, which is right down the street from where he went to school. Um, and also marked on the map is his, his mother's nail shop, it's, which serves not just as a place location, but it also locates us in class and race with this astonishing efficiency. In the bottom quarter of the page, See that big kind of Star Wars thing? Um, he shows us some stuff I remember, and it's it's deliberately not in chronological order. It's things he remembers from grade school, and they're all kind of all at once and concurrent. There's no you don't have to read one first. They don't make a story; they're separate. Um, just like our, you know, that's how our memories exist in our head, all jumbled up together. Um, but I found myself reading these different panels, even though there's no clear way of how to do it. I read them clockwise, like a clock, <clears throat> which is a kind of another interesting way that time <coughs> sort of exerts this force on us as, as readers of comics. Um, this is a page from a staggering piece by Chris Ware that I can barely even talk about either. I mean, it's just so superhuman. Um, it makes me want to poke my eyes out with my pen nibs. <laughs> um, I know you can't read this, it doesn't matter. This is a passage from this remarkable project that Chris has done called It's, it's the Life of a Character Named Jordan W. Lynn, where he draws this guy's whole life from birth to death. And he shows the experience of being born and the experience of dying. It's really crazy. And it's, it's so intricate and it's so fragmented that honestly, you don't I'm not sure I really even understand it all. I need to spend a lot more time with it. But one really amazing thing is that he tells the guy's story at the rate of one year per page. And so each page of the story, even though it's composed of many panels, becomes kind of one big macro panel um, by virtue of the fact that he gives it the date. Like in very tiny letters at the top of this page, you see the date, November 19th. 2019. And what's happening is that Jordan Lynn is reading up, this is a web page, he's looking at a book review on the New York Times website of his son's graphic memoir. And the next page, you turn the page and you are in the son's graphic memoir. Um, and the date at the top of the page is the same as the preceding date, like it's the father reading this work on the computer. The next page, the son's story continues in this, you know, totally crazy opposite style to what Chris Ware normally does. This kind, of, this is kind of crudely expressionistic, emotional, raw story. And now the top, the date at the top of the page is summer 1995. And the next page, the date at the top of the page says. Or was it 1996? And it's like the father is like getting taken 
back to this moment and he's uncertain about it. And then the next page, it said it was 1996, summer 1996. And it's this horrifying story of the, of the father breaking the son's collarbone, which the father had like locked out of his memory. And then the next page, there's no date. This is all this raw experience and pain. And the, presumably the father is now like back in that moment. And then we're back to November 19th, 2019. It's just totally breathtaking. Not only is it a brilliant storytelling, but it's this funny critique of, of graphic memoirs and their perhaps sometimes overwrought emotionality. Um, but at the same time, it's an example of a, a very powerfully effective story. You do feel this kid's pain. I'll wrap up by talking about uh, Kate Beaton, who does a really funny webcomic called Heart of Vagrant. And what happens here is not so much about time, it's about timing. Um, she basically condensed the great Gatsby into nine short three panel, three or four panel gag scripts. <laughs> I'll just show you a few here.